We have been trying to unite the physics of the atom with the physics of the cosmos for more than a hundred years now, when in fact the two are the same thing. I have used the phrases physics of the atom and physics of the cosmos very intentionally, instead of just saying quantum and astrophysics. This is because the formalisms of both theories, that is, quantum theory and relativity, are both going the wrong way. These two branches of physics are fundamentally tangled with each other. They are equivalent in all respect, and I can say that the atomic world and the cosmic world are the same. There is a mathematical framework that I have developed that proves the equivalence of the two systems, and all videos on that are under one playlist titled Quantum Gravity. Feel free to check it out. This new playlist, titled Waves and Particles, is a consequence of the Quantum Gravity playlist, and here we shall be dealing with concepts such as wave-particle duality, space-time and media of propagation of waves, gravitational and electromagnetic waves and their equivalents, photons and gravitons and their equivalents, and so on. So, if this is your first time here, press the subscribe button and the notification icon to join me in rewriting the whole of modern physics. If I ask the question, do electrons orbit the nucleus of an atom in the same way planets orbit the star of a solar system, what will you say? Well, those with just basic knowledge of physics will say, yeah, probably. However, those with higher knowledge or studies will disagree and say that the electron forms what is known as an electron cloud round the nucleus and that the electron has no definite position in that cloud orbit, but is everywhere in the orbit at the same time. Although that sounds kind of preposterous, it is the sort of thing that is acceptable in quantum mechanics. So, in quantum mechanics, Rutherford's model of the atom is thrown out, and this electron cloud theory is adopted. Well, if I now ask a different question, is the Bohr model of the atom correct? The answer will be yes for both those with basic and those with advanced knowledge of physics. So, they both agree on that. But the quantum physicists will say that even though the Bohr model is correct, it is incomplete because it is only able to describe the hydrogen atom but not atoms of bigger elements. I hope we can agree that the above statements are true and accurate, and therefore can be used for further discussion. Moving on. Let us start by assuming that electrons orbit nucleus exactly like planets orbit the sun. Pay close attention to this assumption, as everything depends on it. In this case, the centripetal force on the electron is given by the Coulomb's force of attraction. Q is the charge of the nucleus, little e is the charge of one electron, and r is the orbital radius. K, of course, is the Coulomb's constant. According to circular motion, this force is equal to the mass of the electron little m times the centripetal acceleration v squared on r, where v is the linear velocity of the electron. Making v squared the subject of the formula, we have v squared equal to kqe over mr. But linear velocity is distance covered over time taken, and for one complete cycle, v is equal to 2 pi r divided by the period. So, our equation becomes this, which when rearranged, 
give this. This is Kepler's dead law. The angular momentum of this electron is given by L equal to mvr. And since v is equal to 2 pi r over t, we have L equal to this. Taking t from the Kepler's dead law and solving it here gives L equal to the square root of this over 2 pi. Remember, we started by assuming that electrons are in orbits like planets. When we look at a solar system, we see planets in discrete orbits, which therefore implies discrete radii. So, we can write that the radius of any electron is an integer multiple of the first radius R0. But for this video, we shall use R equal to n squared times R0. Visit my other video titled Planck's Constant of the Cosmos for any clarification. This derivation is there in more detail. Also, for a hydrogen atom, Q is equal to E. That is, the charge of the nucleus is the same as the charge of the electron since the hydrogen atom only has one proton. Putting this in the momentum equation yields n times d square root over 2 pi. Let this square root be equal to some constant h, since everything under the square root is a constant. Subbing in the values of these constants yields h equal to 6.4 exponential minus 34 joules second. This is the value of the Planck's constant. If you use more accurate values of the constants under the square root, you will have around 6.6 .6 exponential minus 34 joules second. Therefore, we can write the angular momentum as n times h on 2 pi. This is the Bohr formula for the hydrogen atom showing the quantization of angular momentum. We started by establishing that all physicists agree on the fact that the Bohr model is correct and the planetary model is wrong. Now, we assumed that the planetary model is correct and by that assumption, we have derived the Bohr model. If the planetary model was wrong, we wouldn't have been able to arrive at this correct result. But the fact that we have implies that the planetary model is correct. So, the Planck's constant is equal to the square root of 4 pi square times the electrostatic constant times the mass of an electron times the square of the electronic charge times the Bohr radius. You can follow this same procedure to derive the angular momentum for a planet, which will be of the same form as follows, from which we can extract in the same way the Planck's constant of the cosmos, g, equal to this. Its value is 1.72 exponential 42 joules second. Check the video Planck's constant of the cosmos for details. In my other video titled The Schrodinger Equation for Planets Basics under the Quantum Gravity Playlist, I have shown mathematically, just like I have done in the previous example, that the energy of a planet is equal to the Planck's constant g times its associated frequency. In the same way, the energy of an electron is equal to the Planck's constant h times the associated electron frequency. You can check the video to ensure that you understand that there is no flaw in the math or the physics of the proof. 
you have seen how smoothly and flawlessly I have derived the cosmic Planck's constant g. So we can both agree that it is safe to use it in further discussions. The reason why the Bohr model was accepted was because it was able to predict and explain the emission lines of hydrogen. Let's look at how it did that. Niels Bohr simply proposed that the energy difference between any two orbits of an atom was equal to the Planck's constant times the frequency of the emitted radiation, F. So, this equation was used to find the frequencies of the light emitted by the hydrogen atom as follows. The frequencies gotten from this formula match those experimentally observed, and so Bohr was given the Nobel Prize. Let us use the same approach for our equation to see what we get. So frequency is equal to the difference in energy over G. Let us take some data from our solar system. The energy of the orbit of Neptune with quantum number 88 is 1.5 exponential 33 joules. Refer to the video titled Quantization of Angular Momentum in Solar Systems to see how the quantum numbers for the planets are gotten. The energy of the orbit of Mercury is 4.3 exponential 32 joules. The difference in energy between these two levels is equal to 1.07 exponential 33 joules. G is equal to 1.72 exponential 42 joules a second. So the frequency is equal to 6.2 exponential minus 10 hertz. Do you recognize what kind of frequency this is? It falls in the range of frequencies of gravitational waves. The frequency is relatively small because solar systems are also relatively small. Things like black holes and star clusters will produce much larger frequencies, as has already been detected. This again confirms that the planetary model of the atom is correct and accurate, while introducing the equivalence of gravitomagnetic or GM waves, also known as gravitational waves, with electromagnetic or EM waves. Continue to part B, let's continue with the proof of this new concept of equivalence of GM and EM waves, and the discovery of the graviton, which is the particle that particle physicists have been looking for for the past 50 years to complete the standard model.